So last time we were talking about uh, native gene regulation um, in, in the context of all the different kinds of ways that nature and specifically cells and even more specifically prokaryotic cells have evolved different modalities to perform regulation of genes such that when we as metabolic engineers think about how do we control different enzyme concentrations ultimately in the pathways that we might be adding or that we desire, as well as how do we downregulate or upregulate flux of native pathways. Um, we have lots of tools at our disposal um, in addition to just gene knockout. And so um, we're almost through uh, covering how this works in some native pathways, including those for which regulation uh, of a pathway in terms of keeping a key metabolite at a relatively fixed concentration. This idea of homeostasis um, is present. And we looked at last time uh, the aromatic amino acid biosynthesis pathway as one of these examples of multi-layered negative feedback. So the slide I ended on last time covered how um, there's this critical enzyme that catalyzes the first committed step, the DAHP synthase, um, allowing the formation of this metabolite, um, which is clearly regulated um, by the end products, the three aromatic amino acids. Um, and, and this evolved to be such that there are actually three different versions of this enzyme. So there's this um, post-translational um, regulation through the form of enzyme inhibition. And in addition to that, there's also transcriptional uh, repression mechanisms. And those come in two forms, um, a tire R and a trip R. And so here you have this, this intricate balance uh, of, of different regulation, suggesting that, in fact, this pathway is it's probably not something that the cell wants on all the time. And so starting to think more about the engineering implications of this, it's not only that you've got these different control knobs to be mindful of, but you may also find, and this may match with the max theoretical yields or net pathway reactions that you calculate, that these pathways, something about them might be energetically expensive. Um, something that the cell really doesn't want to do more of than it has to. Now, one of the other topics that um, was a really high interest to uh, geneticists and uh, molecular biologists a long time ago, around the time of the LAC operon, was the behavior of the TRIP operon. And, and so I'm not going to try to digress too much um, into different regulatory modalities uh, because we already covered that. But while I'm on the subject of aromatic amino acid biosynthesis, I thought I'd highlight this example of the TRIP operon um, because it's a good refresher on what we discussed before. And it's a really unique mechanism that couples transcriptional and translational regulation uh, all into one. So what's illustrated here is your typical kind of trip biosynthesis operon or any biosynthesis operon. And here there's a leader sequence and there's something called an attenuator. Um, and this notion of attenuation, which you see here resulting in a shorter mRNA transcript, um, is, this, is this coupling of transcription and translation. Um, it effectively results in premature termination of transcription, which, which you see here. Um, and, it, and it relies kind of on this idea that um, as an RNA is being made, you can have a ribosome come in and bind that transcript, even as it's being elongated. Um, and then in this case, what has evolved in several bacteria, including E. coli, is this uh, dependence on tryptophan concentration. Um, and so under high tryptophan concentration, you don't get the transcript being fully elongated to include these biosynth biosynthetic genes. Um, we could look just at a little bit more molecular detail on how that happens in this slide and the next. Um, 
So we'll actually look at what the, the RNA sequence looks like um, on the next slide. But here, still at a conceptual level, we have a high level of tryptophan. What can happen is that you have these tryptophan uh, codons. And, and so if you, if you have tryptophan available at high level, presumably you have it attached to tRNA at a reasonably high level. And then the ribosome is just going to speed through this um, transcript and be able to take that tryptophan that's attached to tRNA and stick it onto the growing peptide chain. And so it moves through here quickly. And when it does so, there's this region in, uh, illustrated here um, as denoted as, as the second region um, that is going to be quickly bound by the ribosome and therefore you're going to get formation downstream in your transcript of this stem loop, um, which is actually a terminator. And so it kicks off an RNA polymerase. Um, so again, imagine that the RNA polymerase was just making this um, RNA sequence fresh off of the DNA. And so it got to about here as the ribosome was starting to, to translate it, and then it gets kicked off. But if you actually have a low level of tryptophan, um, and you see this in, in, in not only in tryptophan, but in some other cases um, as well, um, like uh, release factors which terminate um, translation also have this kind of autoregulation phenomenon. Um, when you have a um, low level, your ribosome gets slows down in its actual speed here and is waiting to try to find or grab onto an amino isolated tryptophan. And so while it can't find that, there's actually some affinity between the single-stranded RNA sequence in the region encoded as two here that, that has a tighter affinity um, with region three and, and basically flips the switch um, and, and reveals um, this, this downstream region uh, without a terminator, such that the RNA polymerase can continue unimpeded. Um, and so just to explain what I've said again, um, this, this circle is a little bit off, I'll explain that in a second. Attenuation here is um, preventing the completion of transcription. You've got, um, uh, you've got some translation beginning here, and so the ribosome then encounters, in this case, it's actually two tryptophans in a row, um, therefore you know, kind of doubling down. I mean, ribosomes actually have a tendency to slip sometimes if they stall um, or if there's some low amino acid concentration, just as kind of an emergency mechanism to continue translation. Sometimes proteins don't need every amino acid and the ribosome can actually skip a codon. But here you've got two tryptophans, so it's going to stall and it's going to hang out there if tryptophan is low in concentration. And so then, um, you know, here at the sequence level, you can see uh, it's not very apparent how three and four might have a region in which they would attach to one another um, or some, some binding affinity between two and three. Uh, in either case, this is where your transcription, your RNA polymerase soon after the terminator just gets kicked off. Uh, and this is where otherwise, if you, if you have um, the whole uh, transcript, you would continue translation. I see a hand raised, so I will pause for a question. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so with regards to the, I mean, I've, I guess I've looked at this a bit too, but with regards to the ribosome stalling and occasionally sort of shifting, is there anything that, that indicates or uh, would sort of trigger the ribosome to shift within the reading frame versus mm. just uh, sort of an out of reading frame shift? Because, you know, there are the, the triggered frame shifts too. Yeah. And in fact, um, right, for example, the release factor example, um, that I was mentioning, I believe, is is an out of frame shift, yeah. just a single base pair. You know, I, I don't know. I don't have a definitive answer to your question, given that we, we we're both aware of these two different examples. Although here there isn't actually a, a shift that's required. Right. So I'm I was kind of speculating, but my sense, uh, and and I looked at this um, during my postdoc as well, is that actually a a in frame shift is a lot more evolutionarily favorable, um, given that you're much more likely to still make some protein that would at least fold somewhat correctly. Um, you, you know, you have that much higher chance of getting something that might still work. Um, at the same time, having to shift three base pairs is um, perhaps a harder operation, just in terms of 
the, the sort of interactions. I mean, well, a ribosome is normally moving at um, three base. Yeah. So, so I guess it's it's very speculative on my part. There probably is um, an answer, uh, and it, it is actually something that you could imagine using synthetic biology tools to test fairly directly, although probably also subject to codon context. Um, so, did okay. that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay.